Welcome everyone from all around the world for our session tonight, which is interpreting the Fair Play Report. It's uh, another free webinar brought to you by Tornello and we look forward to uh, a good session. Um, and of course, any questions, type them in the chat. So let's jump straight into it. What we're doing in this session is really focusing on uh, the Fair Play Report and the decision-making process that uh, that you will follow to try and work out whether people in your tournament are playing fairly or not um, and and how you can have some kind of real world practical examples uh, of, of how to do some interpretations on the fair play report. So we're covering the concepts and metrics and some examples uh, in the session today. First thing to always think about when we're talking about fair play is to think about um, you know, what is the first rule of chess? What is the number one rule um, in chess tournaments? You know, should you be trying your best to win? It's a two-player game. Uh, white moves first, don't cheat. What are, there are some options there. The answer, of course, is from FIDE, the number one rule of chess. Rule number 1.1 in the FIDE laws of chess is that chess is a game played between two players, right? And this is the critical part of uh, fair play, is that as soon as somebody gets some help from a, an engine, a computer, another player, a book, it's no longer a game of chess between two players. And that's what makes this such a, a fundamental breach of the regulations. Uh, and that's why it's quite an emotional, uh, an emotional aspect of chess because it is the first rule that people are, people are breaking when they're getting help in the game. So we've got an example here of a couple of great moves way back in 1999, uh, where there's a player who's just playing better than what you could possibly believe, you know, playing this move in the first diagram of queen a7, right, uh, which is an extremely unhuman-like move. Um, to, to win the game. Uh, or in this other situation, knight takes g4 with lots of complications in time trouble. So sometimes uh, even you know, two decades ago, uh, people were trying to get assistance in their games and we have to try to identify uh, in those situations, what is a computer and what is a person making the moves? And it's, um, it's not always that easy to tell. So in chess, there are different types of, uh, of, of kind of motivations for people who are breaking the rules in chess tournaments. Um, I kind of break them down into, into two categories. There's the opportunistic cheating, um, which, is, uh, which is where people are cheating because it's easier to cheat than it is to play fairly. And then there's malicious cheating. That's where people are deliberately and with forethought planning how they're gonna get away with doing the wrong thing and, and getting some help during their games of chess. I think most cheating is opportunistic. Uh, most people are um, you know, honest individuals and they just find it very difficult to control themselves to, to keep their to keep their, uh, you know, their that that self-control um, and it's if it's really easy to cheat if it's really easy to get help in your games uh, you might find that lots of people are getting some help um, whether that's a little bit every now and then or whether it's like every single move of the game uh, just because it's too easy to cheat and and there's no um, mechanisms in place to slow them down or to stop them from doing that so what should we do as a tournament organizers or arbiters to try to make sure that, uh, that people are less likely to, to try and cheat and that we're kind of eliminating 95 to 99% of the cheating, those people who are, um, who are you know, not doing it deliberately, not going out there and planning how they're gonna get some help and get away with it in advance, but they're just kind of doing it because it's easy to do. Well, there are, there are three steps to ensuring fair play in chess tournaments. The first one is to build an environment where it's 
conducive to fair play, where it's easier to play fairly than it is to get help. We've got to do some supervision of the players to make sure that they are doing the right things. And then after you've supervised, after you've created a good environment, you have to then verify that all the players are doing the right thing. And the verification is what we're really focusing on today. The environment, there's lots of things that you can do, use real names, have an arbiter present, uh, you know, and build a community of people who are, who are um, trusting one another. So um, it, it does go in waves. And if you get a lot of people doing the right thing, everyone will do the right thing. And it'll be a lot easier to spot the people who are cheating. When you've got a lot of people uh, doing the wrong thing, then that spreads and the culture becomes something where you have to cheat in order to get fair result. And, and it also then becomes a lot harder to identify the players who are who are cheating in the tournament, funnily enough. So uh, fair play and honesty breeds more fair play and honesty and helps you to remove the people who are not playing fairly. Supervision it can involve screen share, it can involve cameras, it can involve microphones, all of the tools that you would use uh, you know, on, you know, with, with Zoom or other video conferencing software to try and supervise players. You may have, if you're lucky, arbiters, if it's hybrid tournaments, that arbiters are actually present and can supervise players, but often in online tournaments, you don't have the luxury of arbiters. So supervision uh, has to take place in, in uh, you know, kind of more remote forms like screen share and uh, screen shares and cameras. The main thing that we're focusing on today is we're assuming that you have uh, a good environment. You're playing your tournament on Tonello. You've got real names in use. You've got uh, you know, arbiters present. Uh, you've got some form of supervision in your tournament, uh, whether that's every single player being supervised or just some players being supervised uh, or players that are suspicious being supervised. There should be some form of supervision. And then the final step uh, will be the verification. And so we're going to look at a couple of different uh, verification methods uh, where you can, you, you can just click on the fair play report in Tornello and have a look at this fair play report and to, to decide what's going on. I mean, we've got a screenshot here of a fair play report, and this is a very easy one to tell that somebody's doing the wrong thing uh, because we have a tournament here which is um, full of people who are playing fairly. Everybody in this tournament, except for one, is doing the right thing. And when you have tournaments like that, uh, it, it becomes really easy to see, to see the people who are doing the wrong thing. And you can see we've got one person at the top who's got a much, much different score there. And so we're going to go through that and have a look at how we're going to use these reports to just check that we've done a good job in, in, in the first instance. All of this work that we're doing is about building a community of trust. We're trying to get uh, players who trust one another, who are enjoying playing chess together, right? If you go out there with the idea that you want to try and catch everybody who's cheating and throw them in jail and ban them from chess tournaments, you're going to be destroying trust and you're going to be creating an environment of suspicion, of fear, of unpleasantness, and, and people aren't going to want to come back and play in those type of events. So uh, approach this with the, uh, with, with, the, with the view that you're trying to build trust, you're trying to build communities, and you're trying to protect players um, rather than being out there trying to catch people doing the wrong thing. Uh, at some point, you will need to make a decision. Of course, uh, you'll look at all of the evidence and then you will have to weigh it up and make a decision. Um, when you weigh up the decision, the evidence that you've got, make sure it is evidence and it's not just, ah, oh, somebody said this person's you know, cheating. Um, it, is, it is actually evidence and that all the evidence that you have is pointing in the same direction and that you have more than just one piece of evidence, right? So you want to try and have statistical evidence from the fair play report. You want to try and have uh, you know, physical evidence where you can actually watch them on camera and see them doing something suspicious. You might even want to include uh, an, an opinion from an international master or a grandmaster where you get somebody to review the actual game itself and get them to give you an opinion that 
yep, this looks uh, looks a bit suspicious as well. So you want to try and collect information from multiple sources if you can, and, and you want to see that all of those multiple sources is telling you the same story. And if that's all, uh, if it's all pointing in the wrong direction, then regretfully in some situations, you will have to, um, you will have to make a judgment and remove players from your tournament, disqualify them for getting assistance during their games. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look now at some of the metrics that we can use in the fair play reports and, and how we can go through and analyze those. So I'm gonna have a look at, first of all, um, Professor Ken Reagan. Now, not everybody in the world has access to Professor Ken Reagan's analysis, uh, but if you are lucky enough to have access to, to him, he's the world's leading expert on fair play in tournaments and the analysis that goes on behind the scenes to analyze the players' moves. If you're looking at a Ken Reagan analysis report, you really only need to look at this one column here, which is called an ROI or a raw outlier index. That will tell you the score for each player where the score of 50 is exactly as expected for that player's rating, okay? So a Ken Reagan report will assume that you know the player's ratings and that those players' ratings are reasonably accurate. If you have no idea what the player's ratings are, if they're you know, a thousand points underrated or overrated, you're gonna get some strange results because it is tied to the rating of the player. All right, so you're gonna look at this one column, you're gonna say 50 is exactly normal, that's what we expect. Between 40 and 60, that's mostly normal. You know, it's within a, a, a range of scores, which is, uh, which is, is reasonable. If you're between 60 and 70, then uh, you're starting to take things seriously and uh, you'll probably find that a number of people within that range between 60 and 70 are getting assistance during their games. Uh, and so you want to you know, add supervision or um, you know, start looking for additional evidence. And if you've got a score of over 70, then uh, there's a very high chance that people are doing the wrong thing and you really want to pay close attention to them. Um, there is also a Tonello fair play report, and the Tonello report will give you uh, a real time list of uh, list of um, you know, games and statistics. Again, on the Tonello report, if you're looking for the easy approach, just look at the one number in the column that is the sort score. Okay, a sort score is a number that tells you um, not based on the player's rating, but overall. Um, you know, for any player, it will get the, give the same number regardless of the rating. What sort of what sort of result that person's playing at? A score of anything above zero is just worth having a look at. You normally won't have very many players above zero in a tournament unless you're running a very high level event. Um, if you've got a score of above ten, you're an average club player having a good day. So we say average club player, kind of uh, you know, fourteen hundred, sixteen hundred rating. If you've got a score of 20 or above, you're a 2000 rated player or above, again, probably having quite a good day. And if you've got a sort score of 40 or above, then you're a grandmaster or super grandmaster and you're having a very good day. So we can see here just at a glance on this report where there's a bunch of players who've got very low ratings, we should see nobody here with a score above zero because nobody here is kind of a strong club player. And we've got at least three people here who are playing above Grandmaster standard. Okay, so it should be at a glance, quite easy to identify that you've got at least a few players here who are way above Grandmaster level and they are, there's something definitely going wrong there. And you've got a bunch of players here in the 20s and 30s who uh, should have a rating of you know, 2000 and above. And when you see that their ratings are below 1000, you know that something strange is going on, right? As you're getting closer to zero, it's getting harder and harder to pick. Um, but again, you know, a score of, in this case, 11 and 16 for the player's ratings is still very high for that player. It's still like they're playing a thousand points above their rating. And, uh, you know, all these players here with their names blanked out were in fact disqualified from the event. And um, the majority of them actually came forwards and, um, 
and actually admitted to getting assistance in this particular event and apologized. And of course, we let them come back and play in the very next tournament because um, it's not about punishing people, it's about changing their behavior. And so when they showed remorse and they were able to come forwards and apologize for you know, what they'd done and you know, um, you know, pledge to, to do, uh, you know, to play fairly in the future, we've had a lot of these players here who are blanked out playing in future tournaments and playing completely fairly. All right. So a quick, quick look at it gives you this sort score and um, you can you can go through from from that sort score uh, at a very quick look. All right, so let's have a look at a couple or unpack, I guess, as you would call it, unpack a couple of the key metrics that you'll need to understand uh, and terminology in order to, to really decipher a fair play report. There are two critical numbers, um, and those numbers are what we call a centipawn loss and a move match percentage. Okay, so a move match percentage is exactly like it sounds. How many moves? Did the player pick the move that Stockfish or some other strong chess engine would have played? Right? What percentage of moves across your game or across the event were, were exactly the same as the computer's best move? Right? Top move, move match, what, what, is, what is that percentage? The other number that we're looking at is what we call centipawn loss. So a centipawn is one one hundredth of a pawn. And what we can actually do is measure how close to the perfect move the, player is pl the player's move was. Right? So it might not be a perfect move match. It might not be exactly the move that the computers would have played themselves. But we can measure how close to the computer's perfect move it was. And we can measure that in hundredths of a pawn. Okay? And so what we do is we take an average centipawn loss across a game or a tournament. And that average centipawn loss will tell you, um, you know, on every single move of the tournament, how close are you to playing the best or the perfect move? If you're looking at a Ken Reagan report, you've got an average SCD, which is a scaled difference, which is uh, a centipawn loss, but scaled for the complexity of the moves. Okay, so it's not uh, a, a kind of a raw score. It's been scaled based on the complexity of the moves, just like Ken Reagan's ROI, his um, raw outlier index, is scaled for the rating of the player. All right, so it makes it easy to say, okay, all players should should end up on a score of fifty in their uh, in, in their um, you know in their 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 um, uh, ROI. And, and the average scale difference, uh, you know, gives you gives you, uh, you know, more of a penalty if it's a complicated move because uh, a human would be less likely to to pick the, the the best move in a very complicated situation. So we need to understand this terminology to give you some ideas about, you know, kind of some thresholds uh, in terms of raw scores. Like how often will somebody pick the best move of a computer? Right. So it's worth noting that Stockfish itself doesn't always play the same move in every single position, right? It wouldn't be a very good computer if it did, right? Because all you'd have to do is beat Stockfish once, and then you could just play the exact same moves every time. And if Stockfish is always playing the same moves in response, you would every single time beat the computer. So computers have inbuilt randomization. You know, they, they're not gonna play exactly the same move. So, Stockfish playing against Stockfish will not get a 100% move match, right? So even a computer playing against, uh, playing against itself or playing against a weak opponent, the computer will only match itself about 75% of the time, right? So if you've got a 75% move match, you could very well be Stockfish, right? A, a strong 2,000-type uh, rated player uh, will occasionally get um, move matches in a single game of above 60%, um, but very rarely or never get uh, move matches across a whole tournament of 60%. Uh, club players can get move matches in a single game of above 55%, and scholastic players or juniors, youth, uh, will get 
move matches of above 50% uh, in, in some games, all right? But unlikely that any school level player is going to get in a whole tournament uh, a move match of above 60%. It, it is certainly possible and it happens, you know, quite a, quite a lot that uh, school players playing against each other aren't putting up very much competition. Uh, and so if you're playing against a really easy opponent, it might be easy for the for, for, for somebody to pick a number of moves exactly the same as a computer because they're just really obvious. It's like, hey, look, there's a free pawn. Hey, there's a free bishop. Hey, there's a free rook. And there's a free queen. And so you're just capturing pieces. It's pretty straightforward. So um, don't get locked into you know, these numbers too much. Um, on a small sample size, like all of this is what we call statistical analysis. And statistical analysis is useful when you've got large numbers involved. When I'm explaining how all of these things work to parents, uh, you know, of, of chess players or to the players themselves, when we're having conversations about fair play, I'll often use an analogy of rolling a dice because people understand a dice really easily. If you're trying to roll a six, because that's the best move, if you roll a six, there's nothing to worry about there. Right? It's absolutely possible for somebody to roll a six. Even if you roll two sixes in a row, if you roll a double six, that's going to happen one in 36 times, right? It's not such a big deal to go, well, he rolled two sixes. Like, that's not cheating, right? Um, and so that's how we need to think about these move matches. If we're looking at just one game or a few moves in one game, right, it's it's not out of the, out of the uh, ordinary to, to roll a double six, right? Of course, if you roll three sixes in a row and then four sixes in a row and five sixes in a row and seven sixes in a row, it becomes less and less believable over time. So if you say, hey, look, I've got this dice and I've just rolled 40 sixes in a row, then you're going to start being very suspicious that the, uh, that the dice is loaded in some way or the person's, the person's cheating in some way. All right. So um, the more rolls of the dice you have or the more moves that you're looking at, the more valid the, um, the results are going to be. All right, the same thing works on a move match. Right? A move match is like you're trying to roll a six and you rolled a five. Okay, so, okay, you rolled a five, that's not such a big deal. But if you roll a hundred times and you get only fives and sixes, that's going to be something a little bit suspicious. Like why didn't you get any of those lower numbers? So your centi pawn loss, thresholds like uh, you know what would players be scoring in an in a in an individual game um, occasionally players over 2000 will be scoring uh, a centi pawn loss in a game of below 20 um, it's rare but it will occasionally happen club players 25 and scholastic players very rarely score a centi pawn loss in a game of below 30 so you can use these kind of thresholds to start uh, triggering suspicion. If you see somebody with a move match of more than 60%, you're going to start, you know, sniffing around. Something's, something's starting to smell a bit funny here. Uh, if someone's got a centi pawn loss of below 20, then you're going to start looking a little bit deeper into these, into these situations. When you're looking at all of this statistical information, uh, please take into account the player's rating, like how good they are, what's their strength. Um, so not just their rating, but their strength. So that means that, uh, you know, we've seen situations where players with a rating of 1,200 get disqualified from a tournament, but their strength is actually 2,000, right? Because their rating might be very old or they haven't played in very many tournaments, you know, due to the pandemic. So be, be careful that you are trying to assess the player's strength, their true strength, um, and, and not their, not their rating only. Take into account the time control, and we'll see in a minute the, the difference between uh, you know, results in fast games and slow games. Obviously, players can play much, much better in a, in a classical time control game than they can in a blitz game. Um, and what I've just been saying, like really look at the number of moves that have been analyzed in this, in this uh, you know, evaluation. So if you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at a report, how many moves are, are you looking at? If you're looking at six moves or ten moves, you know you can't really um, you can't really put too much weight on that. But if you're looking at two hundred moves, you can really take that seriously. All right. So this is the Tornello Fair Play report, 
and I'll just kind of go through the columns one by one and make sure that you understand what all of those columns are. So the first column on the left-hand side, uh, this is your ranking. Number one is the person who is playing most like a computer down to the bottom, which is the person who's playing least like a computer. Okay, so generally you'll find that the people who are getting assistance are going to be somewhere in the top few players in the tournament, All right? That's the people who are getting assistance. Okay, then you've got the player's name, their rating, right? And that's the rating that's uh, on Tornello. So you need to, of course, judge, is that their true strength? You know, we've got a player here at 1400 who's in amongst all of these 2000 rated players. Is that because he's getting some assistance or is that because his rating is wrong? It shows you the number of games that have been assessed and the score that the player has uh, achieved from those games in the tournament. So this is like seven out of nine, nine out of 10, eight and a half out of 10. That's their, that's their tournament score. And then the statistical analysis comes after that. Number of moves played and the number of, there's the number of moves that have been analyzed, sorry, not played. So you might see that they've played one game and it was a 40 move game, but this only shows 10. Maybe only 10 of those 40 moves have been assessed in the tournament report. Now, not every single move should be compared against the computer to decide whether somebody's playing fairly or not. Because of course, move number one, white plays E4, it matches Stockfish, okay? Black plays E5 and white plays Knight F3, it matches again, right? Do those moves, the fact that they match perfectly what the computer's playing, do those mean that they're cheating? Of course not. That's just opening theory, right? Uh, if I take your queen, you're gonna take my queen back. That's a, an exchange of queens. It's a really obvious move, okay? What about in the end game? I'm a queen and two rooks ahead. You've got just a king. Every single move that I make in that situation is gonna be the perfect move because I can't do anything wrong. You know, I've got like an overwhelmingly big advantage. I'm gonna win the game no matter what. So there are lots of situations in a game where we, we don't need to consider whether this move is an indicator of fair play or not. And so we will ignore those moves. So you might see in this moves column, a very small number of moves, even though a large number of moves have been played in the game. All right? And this is a key difference between if you're trying to do your own analysis outside of Tornello and you're using another platform or uh, you know, an engine yourself, um, those, those metrics, those algorithms will most likely not ignore certain moves. And so you'll be getting the whole game and you might end up with a different score. And we had we had an inquiry the other day. Someone said, oh, why is the score so different between Tornello's Sandy Pawn loss and, and a Sandy Pawn loss on, uh, you know, from, from Stockfish? And it's because we're ignoring a lot of moves. There's a lot of things that we just don't, don't really need to know about. So number of moves is really important. Um, if you've got fewer than 100 moves, you need to start um, being uh, a little a little, uh, you know, don't rely on it too heavily if you've got less than 100 moves. And if you've got fewer than 30 moves, don't even bother looking at it at all. Between 30 and 100, you can start taking it more and more seriously as time goes on. Um, but really kind of 100 moves is, is my threshold for being confident or, or at least reasonably confident that the, uh, that the results that you're looking at are fair. Uh, CPL, we've talked about that. That's your centipawn loss. So that tells you, on average, this player is losing 0.29. So that's nearly uh, a third of a pawn on average every single move during the game. Okay, so these are these are um, you know all kind of uh, centi pawn loss numbers that are that are normal. If you see a number below 20, you're you're starting to get very suspicious there because humans uh, are not playing. Even Magnus Carlsen and uh, and Kasparov are not playing sub. 20 centi pawn loss games um, very often, and certainly not in the whole tournament. Your move match percentage here, this tells you the, the move match percentage. Um, obviously we've got one that's at 60%, but everybody else is below that magic 60% number. So uh, mostly looking okay. Our score column. So the score is the, is the one number that you should be looking at uh, in a Tornello report if you're only looking at one number and that number will, will give you uh, that kind of uh, strength indication. Now, if it's above 40, then it's a grandmaster. If it's above 20, then it's 2000 rating and above. 
uh, and, and anything above zero is just worth having a quick look at. The analysis levels here, we've got A, B, C, and D. <clears throat> Tornello takes an approach where we're trying to prove that people are playing fairly. We're not trying to catch cheaters. We're trying to actually prove that you've played fairly. Now, if Tornello can't prove that you've played fairly on level A, it will go to level B and it will do a, a second analysis uh, and it will look at different things. It will look deeper into the game. It will say, well, can I prove you played fairly now? And if the answer is no, then it'll go to level C. And if it can't, it'll go to level D. Okay. So if you're not playing fairly, if you're, if you're getting assistance in the game, you will um, almost always get all the way through to level D because Tornello hasn't been confident that you've played fairly. Okay. Um, so level D doesn't mean that you're cheating, but anything below level D means that they're most likely playing fairly. Okay. So don't think about it like, oh, look, I can see a whole heap of level Ds. They're cheating. We've got a lot of cheaters in this tournament. It's not the way it works. It's the opposite. Anything that isn't level D, you can kind of go, phew, they're doing okay. Um, and level D will be uh, just, we haven't yet proven that they're playing fairly. Right? It doesn't mean that they're not playing fair. It's just that we can't prove it uh, just by analyzing their games. So um, you, you often want to look at the tournament as a whole. Here's a visualization. We haven't got visualizations on Tornello yet, but we will have this. And you can see these visualizations where you can say, well, there's a bunch of players in this kind of range here. This is move match and Cindy Paul loss. We've got Gary Kasparov and Capablanca and Magnus Carlsen kind of in this range here. Um, and, and here's, here's a, you know, a player and here's Stockfish way out here. All right, so have a look at you know, everything in context. And you should see the lower rated players kind of out the back with, uh, you know, much bigger centi pawn losses, uh, you know, much lower move match percentages. And you'll have, uh, you know, people who are who are cheating uh, above 60 percent move match and, you know, around 20 or below 20 in uh, in in move match. Um, so in uh, yeah, below 20 in centi pawn loss and stockfish way out here is is going to have a, a move match of about 75 percent. Uh, against itself. So, you know, when you're looking at a report, try and kind of have a, a big picture view. So what we want to do is get into some uh, some detailed examples uh, and, and have a look at, you know, some obvious uh, examples of people who are cheating. All right. So here's a fair play report with what we call an outlier, right? Most of the people in this tournament are kind of around the same rating. They're all in the sort of under 1400, under 1500 rating range. Uh, and you've got one person who's got a score of 24 and everybody else below zero. So in this example, it's really easy. One person's way out in front. Everyone else is below zero. Easy, easy to spot the, some, the person who's, uh, who's getting some help in their games. All right. Uh, so that's an outlier, somebody who's significantly different from everybody else in the tournament. And it, it is a good idea to kind of compare players in the tournament with, with one another. All right, uh, what you can do is, is from, from here, you can click on any player's name and drill down to see round by round, round one, round two, round three, round four, round five, six, seven, and you can actually see the individual scores in each game. So if you've got a score of minus a thousand, that just means that this game is, uh, is, is, doesn't have, any, doesn't have any, uh, any result, like we can't actually judge anything from that game. So you can ignore anything with a negative a thousand. And here you can see that this player has got some very different results here, right? We've got scores of 43, 52, 53. Now remember a sort score of above 40 is a grandmaster. Anytime that we're seeing um, move matches of above 60%, we're saying, well, that's kind of Magnus Carlsen level and above. Um, we're looking at centi pawn losses where you've got centi pawn losses that are you know, below zero. That's super significant. But of course, with these ones, you've got a very small number of moves. Okay, so we say, well, we don't want to make too much of a judgment about any individual game because there's a very small number of moves, but we can see that there's a bit of a trend here. We've got a bunch of really, really high scores. And then in this situation, what we did is we used the fair play report um, during the tournament to actually talk to the player and say to the player, hey, look, in round seven, 
we'd like to supervise you more closely. And we put their camera on because for the first six rounds, didn't have his camera on, didn't have his screen shared. All right, so round seven starts getting supervised and look at the difference. So from scoring in the 60s and 70s as a move match, as soon as his camera was switched on, he's scoring 13%. From scoring centipawn losses of, you know, below 20 in, in you know, multiple occasions, as soon as his camera switched on, he's scoring 131. Okay, so by, by using the fair play report in real time, like during the event, that's what's going to give you the, the best outcomes. Right. If you wait till after the tournament and then sit back and say, well, gee, you know, what, what am I going to do about this? You, you won't know after the tournament's finished, was this the game that somebody was supervised and the rest of them they weren't. You won't, you won't be able to be sure. You're like, well, you know, maybe he had really easy games. This is a very small number. And, and it will be very hard to be, um, to be really confident uh, in, in any, any sort of statistics after a, after a tournament's finished. So ideally, the fair play report is giving you real-time information that will help you to choose the people that you want to supervise right? Because you've got hundreds of people in your tournament or dozens of people in your tournament, and you can't supervise all of them closely. So the report, the fair play report, will tell you which players are looking suspicious and the ones that you should be supervising more closely, right? This is a tournament that was actually played on uh, a, a Lee Chess, it was on a non-Tornello platform, and then we ran this through our fair play uh, results. So um, you can see that uh, what what is you know, other, other platforms are completely automated. Tornello allows a human to get involved. And, and, you know, where a computer might say, well, this person hasn't reached whatever threshold that you need to reach to uh, auto-ban them on, on, on a platform, you know, a human can look at it and go, wow, you know, why have you got a score of 30 and everyone else has a score of minus, okay? Because most of the players are at the same, same rating level, okay? And so human and computers working together is, is always going to be, uh, you know, a, a better outcome than just letting computers just do it on their own, right? Because there'll be thresholds, there'll be, you know, there'll be examples like this where a person, uh, you know, has been playing on, on a platform and, you know, it's quite clear to a human, it's just that they haven't played enough games on the platform for the platform to trigger that automatic disqualification. Here's another one that was also played on, uh, on, a, on, a, on an external platform, on a mega, mega site. Um, and again, you can see a very high sort score compared to everybody else, right? So this is a good way of, uh, of, of identifying people who are doing the wrong thing when you've got a lot of people who are playing fairly in your tournaments, right? And that takes time to build that community, build that culture of fair play. Um, and just by eliminating the top two or three people each tournament, even if you start off with a lot of people who are cheating, you'll end up in a situation like this where most people are playing fairly and it's really easy to determine the person who's playing <clears throat> unfairly. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is some of the uh, kind of smart analysis that we can do on Tornello. All right, so here we have a player whose rating's 1,300. <clears throat> They've got 209 moves assessed, which is a, a good solid number of moves. So that's um, a definitely statistically valid result. And they've got a score of nine. You go, well, right, you've got a score of nine. Now, a score of nine is a club player, strong, you know, club player having a good day. So like 1,500, 1,600, okay? well within reach of somebody who's 1,300 rating. So on this basis, on this standard analysis, we, we probably wouldn't disqualify that player. We wouldn't really even um, be, be concerned about the player, right? We can see a couple of high move matches, like you've got a 68 and a 61. Like, that's a bit suspicious. Like, you've got some very high scores there, but they're only individual games, so we can't pay too much attention when there's only a small number of moves. But what we can do is we can switch this analysis mode from a standard analysis to what we call a smart cheating mode. And in a smart cheating mode, it's going to discount a lot of a lot more moves, and it's just going to look at um, and, or try to work out is this player just cheating on some of their moves and not all of their moves, right? And we can now see 
that we've got a result that's significantly different. Now we've got a score of 19 with a move match of 62%. You've still got over 100 moves, right? And so in this case, you can now be a lot more confident that somebody has been playing uh, or getting some assistance. In particular, you can see these last two games, round five and round six, where we've got uh, you know, 16 moves and 25 moves. So you know, reasonable number of moves in a particular game, but really, really high scores, 88% and 76%. So Stockfish will very rarely be able to match itself 88% of the time, right? And so, you know, you've got this sort score of an individual game of 65 and 71, massive scores. Most likely my interpretation of this report would be that the player has played fairly for the first four games and he's got some help in the last two games, all right? And he probably hasn't got help in every single move of those last two games. So you can see here, he's got a 39 and a 26, right? But when you switch on the, the smart cheating mode, here we go, he's got very high scores and, and you can start identifying, uh, you know, something's gone wrong. So this player was actually disqualified after six games uh, and didn't get to play a seventh game. And of course, any time that you could do this in real time, it's going to make your tournament much, much better, even if you only disqualify them before the last round, because then the results are kind of fair. If you wait till the end of a tournament, you've got to look at the, the, the statistics and then you decide, yeah, okay, I'm going to disqualify this player. It's too late. They've caused the damage, right? They've played all of their opponents. They've won the prize in the tournament. You've got to take it away from them. You've got to readjust everybody's scores in the tournament. So. If you can use the fair play reports, if you can interpret them in a way that will give you greater ability to pick people during the event, then that is definitely what you should be doing. Let's have a look at this one. So here's another example of a player where um, maybe they're not cheating in every single game. They're only cheating in some games. And a lot of players do this to trick the computer you know, algorithms. Uh, you know, and you can get away with it on some of the mega platforms where they're, they're analyzing, you know, uh, you know, everything and they have to take averages and look at uh, look at the statistics. So you can see here we've got a player who's rating 1743 and he's got a score of 10. There is nothing to be concerned about at all. A score of 10 for somebody who's got a rating of 1700. Perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. OK, so let's now have a look at what happens when we switch on just looking at the best four rounds, okay? So we, we had six games here and he's got four out of six. Now, when we look at just the best four rounds, he scored four out of four and his score has jumped from 10 up to 53. That's a huge jump. His centipawn loss has dropped below that magic number of 20, very suspicious. And the move match percentage has jumped above the move, uh, the move match percentage threshold of 60%, which is very suspicious. The only thing you have to be careful here of is that his number of moves that's played in this tournament has now dropped to 69. It's dropped below 100. So this is not somewhere where you can be supremely confident that this is that this is a disqualifiable offence because it is below 100 moves. And so you want to be still uh, relying on some physical evidence where observing the player uh, because this is just not, uh, it's not quite where you'd like it to be. I mean, this is a very, very high score. Um, and if you knew the player and you knew his rating was accurate, I mean, 53 is, you know, well, 40 is a grandmaster, as a super grandmaster, right? <laughs> you know, that's 40. So, you know, getting 53 is massive. Uh, here's another example uh, of a player where you can see all of his games. So this is a player who's played eight games and scored five out of eight, right? Now his rating's 432. So it's a very low rating and he's got a score above zero, which is, unusual in the first place. So we're saying, okay, you got five out of eight, you've got a score of eight, which is a bit unusual for your rating, but maybe you're underrated. Maybe that someone's typed the rating in wrong. Maybe you should be 1400, in which case this would be okay, right? So let's switch on now the best five rounds only. And instead of looking at all eight rounds that he's played, we're just gonna look at the best five. We've got 105 moves here. So we're confident in this result and wow, we've got a score of 52, okay? So we've got the massive move match above 60%. We've got a centipawn loss below 20, 
and we've got this sort score, which is way up at 52. Look at the difference, eight to 52. So this shows you how players can kind of, uh, you know, try to be smart cheaters by, by cheating only in some games and not all games. And you can probably see in this tournament, right, round one, negative 90. Fair play in round one. Cheats for the next five games and then plays fair for the last two, right? Now, you score five out of eight because you've won five games in a row with some assistance and you don't get flagged by uh, a lot of computer programs uh, or, or, or fair play detection methods because you've, you've confused the averages, right? You know, on average, you're only going to get a score of eight, right? You've confused the averages with some really, really bad results, you know, natural play. So using this best number of rounds, again, look for the number of moves, make sure you've, you know, ideally got that above 100. Um, and if you can see a score like 52, and it's a jump from eight to 52, this is a really clear example. Somebody's going to get distracted. All right, um, be aware of the scores um, relative to your time control in the tournament. OK, so the faster the time control, the lower your scores are going to be. So here we have a European championship event with a number of you know, strong, strong players. Like these players are all 21 to 2500 strength. And this is a rapid tournament. So 25 minute games. And in this tournament, I can't remember, there was about 120 players. We've got a handful of people who scored above zero, but most people are below zero. And there's, there's a handful who are above zero. There's one person who's way up at 18, but he's IM strength, right? And a score of 18 is completely fine. An IM can be scoring, you know, up to 30 without too much of a, without too much concern, right? We've got a couple of, you know, GM standard players here, you know, and they're 24, close, close to 2,500 strength, and they're scoring, uh, you know, quite low, quite low results. Um, and it's possibly because there's a lot of other very strong players that, that are that are really challenging them. So we've got not many scores above zero. We've only got one score that's significantly high in a, in a rapid tournament. Now we look at the same players playing a blitz tournament, exactly the same players. So we've got exactly the same uh, sample group, you know, the same ratings of the players. So here's our player 2478. Here's our player 2478, right? In a rapid tournament, he's scoring eight. 2478 in a blitz tournament, negative three. So master level players in a blitz tournament, nobody's scoring above zero. Well, okay, there's one person scoring above zero, but it's just a tiny bit above zero, okay? So be aware that these, these scores are raw scores. That is, they just tell you a number and you have to use your interpretation. You have to understand, okay, if it's a slow play tournament, you should expect scores that are a bit higher than a blitz tournament. Uh, this is an example of a, of a world championship event uh, that has both Ken Reagan analysis and Tornello analysis uh, at the, in the, in the same, uh, for the same players in the same games, right? There was about a thousand players in this tournament, so it's a very large tournament. And this shows you a ranking of the most suspicious person on Ken Reagan's analysis down to the top 30. And then this is what Tornello ranks them in terms of you know, how close they are to a computer. The top players are usually gonna be very, very similar. Okay, so the number one player was exactly the same. Number two and three were the same. Three is down to 12. They're, they're generally kind of pretty close in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, keeping, keeping at the same level because both of these are ranking players if you're at the top of the page, you're more likely to be getting assistance than if you're at the bottom of the page. Okay. Um, now, what, what we have here is the, the percentage move match. So we've got a 70% move match here, a 64.7, so really high move matches there. Anything above 60, you're starting to go, wow, that's really high. We've got the Ken Reagan uh, average scale difference, which is not a centipawn loss, but it is very similar to a centipawn loss. And um, in the Ken Reagan reports, you're looking for anything below 0 0.1 as being incredibly suspicious. So our top four players are really suspicious on average centipawn loss. They're also the top four players in the list. We've got our ROI. Remember, anything above 70 is extremely suspicious. So again, those top four players 
Um, and anything between 65 and 70 is, uh, is kind of a bit suspicious. This tells you the number of moves that have been played and their score in the tournament. All right. Um, now, Tornello has been able to flag some of these players before the end of the event. All right. And the limitations of waiting for a Ken Reagan report like this is that you've got to wait till the end of the tournament. And so people have played, you know, nine or 10 games. They've, they've impacted the, the tournament results for everybody when they've, when they've cheated. And the, the top four, uh, you can't really see, but these ones, there's, there's a couple of names in red that were actually disqualified from the event. So there was five people disqualified from the event. So it's the top four plus number eight was, was removed. Now, um, you know, we flagged these, some of these players, you know, anywhere up to four hours before the last round was played. Okay. So you can actually identify the players, you know, three and four and five hours before the end of the tournament. You can do something about it while the tournament's in progress. So the, the fair play report should be there not to catch cheaters, not to disqualify people, but to help you to supervise players uh, better, to help you know who you should be looking at so you can collect more information, right? And if you can change people's behaviour by talking to them, right, so much the better. We saw the example before where we said, hey, jump on camera, we're going to watch you. And by telling the player that we're watching them, by watching them more closely, the, the player didn't cheat in the last round. And that's a fantastic outcome. That's a good result. If you can do that after three rounds or four rounds or five rounds, right, so much the better. You don't have to disqualify people from your tournament. You just have to let them know that you're suspicious about them and that you're watching them. And could they please play fairly? And if they do play fairly, fantastic. You've, 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 actually, you've actually saved your tournament. You've made a real big impact. So the top four players uh, were able to be removed um, well before we, we, could, we could even get the Ken Reagan analysis back. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to see um, when you compare those results. If you do have the luxury of having both, that you'll get some that are, that are very similar. Occasionally, you'll get one which is a massive difference. Like, why is he ranked number nine in Ken's report, but ranked number 556 in a Tornello report? Now, as it happens, this player was a player from Australia that I know personally, and we, we understand that in this situation that the player has a very low rating, but it's a very, very old rating. So he's consistently playing in over-the-board tournaments and a national rating of like 1,600, but his international rating that was used for this event was only 1,100. So we get a player that on the, on the um, you know, Ken Reagan report is going, oh, you've got a, an ROI of 63, which is in that 60 to 70 range of be a little bit suspicious. I generally really only worry about 65 and above. Um, but you've got someone who's like, wow, he's really highly ranked. There's something maybe going on. But if you know that the player's rating isn't really 1104, but it's actually 1600, then that would have put him from number nine down to you know, number 500 as well. So um, just be, be aware that's how the ratings play. All right, uh, let's just have a look at a couple of uh, live examples on Tornello that I can show you. So this is um, a, a, the European Club Cup. This is a one of the strongest tournaments, uh, you know, in in the world. There's there's uh, something like twenty seven grandmasters and fifty three players or something. So it's a very very strong tournament. And because there's such strong players, you know, players getting up close to twenty seven hundred rating, you would expect the scores to be very high. And so we can see here that. We've got all the scores below 40, which is a good sign, right? These are all grandmasters and super grandmasters, but still nobody scoring above 40. So that's good. Um, and we see that in a move match magic number of 60%, there's a few people. We've got four or five people, but all of them 2695, 2620, you know, 2658. You know, all of these players are, are very highly rated. To be scoring above 60%. Uh, and some of them, like here, 2510, we've got to discount that because there's only 49 moves in this, in this analysis. So we can just ignore that. Okay, so uh, we've got some very high scores here, um, but 
nothing to worry about because those players are so highly rated, right? So when you see a score of 53 in your tournaments, right, ask yourself, well, you know, there's a bunch of 26, 2700 rated players who couldn't score 53. How is it that an 1100 rated player managed to score 53 in, in, in their tournament? All right, here's another example of a, a fair play tournament. This is where everybody's played fairly in the tournament, right? This is a Czech uh, Open, and you can see that Tornello hasn't even, you know, tried to go any deeper. It's like, well, we've proven fair play on level A for everybody. Um, we've got hardly any scores above zero, just five people with a score above zero. And, you know, those top scores of 16 and 19 are both players above 2,000, right? And so players of above 2,000 could easily be scoring, uh, you know, ratings, you know, scores of 20 and above, okay? Um, another quick one. This was a, uh, a blitz tournament. So in a blitz tournament, we're going to be expecting people to be scoring, uh, you know, very low scores. And there were some people in this tournament that we were able to remove um, very early on, uh, before they played, before they played a lot of games. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these. Okay, so you can see these players with with only um, with with very high scores here, with with unrated players, for example. Um, you know, very high score, forty six. Okay, eighty moves. It's not ideal, but in this tournament we were pretty aggressive uh, because it was a blitz tournament, uh, and there were a lot of players. Uh, we were pretty aggressive about removing people early on so that they so that they wouldn't participate and ruin the rest of the tournament for people. So we were able to remove a couple of people uh, early on. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. Remember, Tornello is a free tournament management platform for uh, tournament organisers and arbiters who are looking to run better chess tournaments. Tornello is the same platform that you will use uh, the same tournament pairings program that you will use. If you're running a face-to-face -face over the board tournament, if you're running an online tournament, or you're running a hybrid style tournament where you've got a bit of both, you can use the same software to collect registrations, do pairings, produce results, uh, and of course, do the fair play analysis as well. Even if you're playing an over the board tournament, import the games into Tornello, uh, and then you can do fair play analysis with imported games as well. That feature will be released on the 25th of November, and you'll be able to run your over the board tournament, import your games and check what's going on uh, even in over the board tournaments. Thank you very much everybody again for joining in today. I hope that you have um, feel more confident now in interpreting some of those fair play reports, whether you get them from Ken Reagan or you just get the, the Tornello report, uh, the fair play report uh, live. Um, you know, Use those as a tool to help you in real time during your games. And uh, you know, I wish everybody uh, the best running more um, fair play tournaments, running better chess tournaments, which are better experiences for players all over the world.